So I'm not a huge fan of NASCAR's chase format, and I often debate it with other fans on its validity in the sport. As with any conversation about the chase goes, Matt Kenseth's 2003 Cup title comes up quite a bit. But what I've noticed about many of these people's arguments baffles me. They say that Matt Kenseth shouldn't be considered the 2003 champion. And I'll be frank with you, they're playing wrong, and here's why. Their first point is that wins should matter more. And wins should matter more, more than finishing any other position on the track. But they shouldn't matter so much that you can basically take the majority of the season off and not fall behind. Championships in NASCAR have always been about consistency, luck, and skill in that order. You have to be good for the whole season, but also be lucky enough not to have mechanical failures or be swept up in someone else's problems, as well as be skilled enough to make up the spots, avoid wrecks, and just wheel the car for all she's given you. Almost every year, the driver who accomplishes these three things the best is the champion. And Matt Kenseth in 2003 was no different. Another point they like to bring up is that you need to win races to win the title. And this point is a tricky one. Wins should be a huge part of winning a championship. And Matt Kenseth winning one race in 2003 brought a vast amount of attention to the problem that at the very most, wins only got 15 more points in finishing second. That would be over 90% of what the winner would get, and even making it possible for the second place finisher to be awarded more points than the winner. For an example, Dale Earnhardt Jr. won at Talladega in 2003, and was only awarded five more points than second place finisher Kevin Harvick. Had Harvick led the most laps, he would have equaled Earnhardt in points that race. That was a huge and ignored problem that needed to change. A simpler or less controversial change would have been to add around 20 to 25 more points for a win and maybe slightly adjust the top 10 points rewarding afterwards. Say each winner got 25 more points per win in 2003. The final standings would have looked like this. Even putting Newman 175 points closer, he still would not have been anywhere close to a championship contender in 2003. Instead of doing something like this, something that could have helped fix some of these problems, NASCAR decided to create a system that awarded being good in 26 races and then 10 races instead of the full 36, and quickly over-awarding the importance of wins. There's no reason that a 30th place driver should be a championship contender, or that the driver can sit out a third of the season and still have a championship contending season or win a championship, for that matter. In response to Kenseth's domination, NASCAR decided to reinvent the wheel for a job they only needed one slight adjustment. Another thing they like to say is that Newman won eight races in 2003, while Matt Kenseth only won one. This is true. Newman had more wins than anyone in 2003, the most in a season since Jeff Gordon's 13 1998 and wouldn't be topped until Jimmy Johnson won 10 races in 2007. But Newman also had seven DNFs, which was the most for a top 10 points for Mark Martin's 1994 season and has only once since been surpassed by Ryan Newman the next season with nine DNFs. While Newman had eight wins and was on fire for those wins, he also was extremely cold with those seven DNFs. Kenseth, on the other hand, was smooth throughout the entire season, finishing inside the top 10 25 times. Only twice did Kenseth finish below 10th in consecutive races, with Talladega in Kansas as well as Martinsville in Atlanta. In that vein of consistency, Kenseth finished below 14th only five times, with two of those being DNFs due to engine failure. The 12 team simply was not as good as the 17 team over the entirety of the season. Kenseth simply was faster for the vast major majority of the season over the majority of the field, more often than any other driver in 2003. People also don't realize that there are many drivers who win the most races in a season but fail to win the championship. Rusty Wallace, for instance, won 10 races of 30 in 1993 but was still beat by 90 points by Dale Earnhardt. Jeff Gordon also won 10 races in 1996 but lost out to a in the championship to a far more consistent Terry Labonte. Throughout NASCAR history, there have been scenarios like these playing out. 
Hell, even in the winner-take-all chase format that we currently have, Joey Logano won the most races in 2015 with six wins, but didn't even make the final four to contend for a championship. A question that comes up a lot is, why would fans watch if the title is clinched? My question is, why not? They're not going to be an overblown coverage of the championship that drowns out the actual race. There's also going to be more meaning to the actual Game 7 moments that happen in the sport as well. For instance, what made the 1992 championship battle so breathtaking and incredible? The fact that nothing like it had ever happened before. The fact that six drivers were good enough to all season to be title contenders, and it didn't even need to be manipulated in any way at all. It was an earned championship fight. People like to say that fans wouldn't tune into the finale with an already decided championship. Yet in 2003, when Matt Kenseth clinched a week before, the season finale earned a 4.5 final rating and a 10 share, as well as 7.5 million viewers. To put that in perspective, since 2006, the finale has surpassed those numbers in ratings in 2011 with a 4.6, as well as viewership in 2015 with 7.64 million viewers. That's it. Fans didn't tune out because of the bad title runs, but instead because it felt forced and fake in the chase era. Another thing that people like to bring up when it comes to this is that it's not good for marketing to the younger generations. This is the toughest point to argue because on face value it's true. The average modern day kid or teen basically has the attention span of a goldfish and will use about the same amount of brain power as that said goldfish to understand the intricacies of the sport as a whole. Many try to understand it like football or basketball where it's winning or nothing. But what they unfortunately don't understand is that racing is a different animal from the usual stick and ball sports. What works in one league won't work in another. For instance, the quarterback is arguably the most important member of the team. He can miss the first five games of a season, but come back and win the Super Bowl. Nobody bats an eye because that's how it is, and that's how it's always been for the NFL for years. There are 10 other guys on offense, as well as the 11 guys on defense, who are all on the field and pick up the slack, as well as the people who replace the quarterback. This doesn't translate at all to NASCAR, though. Kyle Busch missed a third of the 2015 season. He was the only guy on the playing field, and now he's out. This was a problem that NASCAR first saw when they implemented the owner's point standings. That way, the entire race team would not be punished, basically made championship irrelevant because a driver was out. So in 2015, the 18 team may have been the best team all season, but Kyle Busch was not the best driver all season. Racing awards both winning and consistency, but for many fans, the word consistent has almost become a slur. Brian France heard this small vocal minority of fans back in 2003 during and after Kenseth's title winning season and devised the chase. Instead, he should have seen what the majority saw. That it was a normal season with a dominating title win, and inevitably, 2004 would be better. Instead, we got the hot mess called modern-day NASCAR. It's been nearly 15 years of the chase, and there's probably not enough fans the, under the age of 30 to fill up a high school football stadium. The chase, against its purpose, has made the sport arguably less inviting towards a younger audience due to its unneeded complexity. Keeping the system simple may not have been a flashy one like today's system, but it would have been an easier system for a younger audience to catch on to, and may have even helped NASCAR garner the younger audience that it, it had been looking for. So diminishing Kenza's dominating season is not the right thing to do. If anything, it should be considered more impressive than a lot of other championships because Kenza had to be consistently better to make up for his lack of wins. Matt Kenta truly was the 2003 champion with no gimmicks, waivers, or interventions at all.